Well, Church at the Red Door, I've got to tell you, this is uh, this is challenging, man. I uh, we we started, we got kicked out of where we were at UCR at the campus, and then we stayed on campus. We were able to set up a set, and uh, unfortunately, after just one week of being on that beautiful set that we had last week, uh, as you know, California has initiated a uh, shelter in place, and so we're not they com- on complete lockdown. So just to let you know, we are right here in my office, in my house, and will be for the foreseeable future. So I don't know what that's gonna look like. I don't know if we're gonna be looking at three weeks or a month or three months, I have no idea. But uh, here's, here's what we're gonna do. So we're still gonna be coming to you every single week, uh, God willing, 9.30, Sunday mornings, and that's uh, hopefully you're over a cup of coffee right now. And uh, we're excited about this. You know, I've really been praying about this this week and um, I was asking the Lord, Lord, I need a word, because last week we talked a little bit about fear, and it's kind of everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's conversation about fear and people freaking out and uh, neighbors and things, and I've called many of you this week and some of you, but you know, even more than fear is really this just deep sense of loneliness. And I've got to tell you, it has broken my heart at how many of you feel so isolated. I know some of you uh, gals have maybe recently lost your husbands, and uh, this is challenging for you. And I had some conversations this morning, and just because of that, you know, it's really, really challenging for you, and it's challenging for us as the pastoral staff because our hearts are just broken. Uh, I was thinking this week as well about Psalm 91, and if you give me a chance, I just want to read a little bit of this to you uh, as it relates to first fear and then loneliness. Psalm 91 is a classic, classic area in the scripture where he's crying out for protection and for refuge from, from all the evil that's around him and it actually is so pertinent to where we are today. Psalm 91 says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. Now that's critical because he's saying you're my refuge. You're my God. I trust in you. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. This whole coronavirus is, he could have been speaking exactly about that. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. Now catch this, he says, you won't be afraid of the terror by night, he said, or the arrow that flies by day, or of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. Now that grabs me. And, and you will not. And you will only look on yourself with your eyes at the recompense of the wicked, for you've made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor any plague come near your tent. Now, again, I think in an ultimate way, just recognizing the resurrection, you know, we live on this side of the resurrection, and as a function of living on this side of the resurrection, we have no fear. I mean, we just have no fear of death. I've got to be honest, is thinking about this week, I have zero fear, zero anxiety, zero. I mean, I just don't fear it. And I, and I was asking myself, I wonder why. Well, because you're young and if you get it, there's a, a, a low probability that you'll die. It goes way beyond that. I just don't have fear of death in any way. You know, we've taken all these trips to the Middle East and some people get kind of fearful about that. I have no fear in that. There's just no fear in death anymore. And so that would be the first thing that I would say is just understanding that we are now covered in the blood of Christ, that we live on this side of the resurrection, and because he was raised, the Bible simply says that we will be raised. And that's critical to understand that on this side of the resurrection, nothing can touch me. You know, the Satan actually used Psalm 91 uh, to talk to Jesus, actually to tempt to Jesus, and, uh, and Jesus' response essentially was uh, not to test God in this. In other words, the test for God is not whether or not uh, the plague ever touches us, whether or not the coronavirus ever touches anybody that we know. That's not the promise. The promise that is that it has no eternal consequence. There's nothing at all that can touch me in an eternal sense. The fear that should arise in people are, are people that, haven't yet believed into the Father and believed into the Son. And as a result, that's where the fear should arise, 
not because of a coronavirus. So if you're out there today and you're thinking, you know, I don't know if I know Jesus, there should be a, a deep sense in which you feel uncovered, if you will, or a sense of fear. And if you are covered by that and you've believed into Jesus and are now following him, let me tell you something, there is zero fear, zero fear. You know, I was also thinking about loneliness and, and uh, I was thinking about Psalm 102. Let me read says, uh, this is a psalmist just crying out and saying, Lord, Lord I, I am really struggling here with loneliness. It says, I lie awake and I've become like a lonely bird on a, on a housetop. Some of you may be feeling that. You know, this whole social distancing thing is probably one of the most challenging things we'll ever undergo. I mean, social distancing, I don't even know what that means. I hate that. I hate even being not being together at church at the red door and not having the ability to give you a hug or to have the ability to, you know, at least shake you shake your hand or look you in the eye. And so the challenge is extraordinary for me. And I've got to tell you and I know it is for for you as well, not being able to gather is driving me a little bit mad. And yet, as I was holding that before the Lord, I said, "Lord, why would it be that we can't we can't come together? What what is this that's going on? We're not even have the ability to come together." And I just felt like He gave me a word. So I want to go down a path with you, and I want to talk about isolation as being something that's actually a God thing, and how might God use it? In fact. I want, to, I want you to think for a minute just about some of the incredible forefathers that we've, that we've had in the faith and that in some ways they were isolationists. I know that sounds a little bit strange, but now think about this for a second. Uh, let's talk a little bit about John the Baptist. I mean, John's very life was a life in the wilderness. In fact, Isaiah, some 700 years before the time of John the Baptist, was looking forward and saw a voice crying not downtown, not with a bunch of friends at a party, but a voice crying in the wilderness. John, John's very life was one that was set in isolation. And as a result, he was used mightily, so mightily, in fact, that Jesus was able to say about John the Baptist, up until now, not a single man has ever lived that was greater than John the Baptist. And I would suggest to you in some ways that the reason for that was that he was, in fact, in isolation. He had the ability and that quiet and that solitude to constantly hear from the Lord. I also think about Jesus himself in Matthew 14, 13, after Jesus had heard that John had been beheaded. It simply says, when Jesus had heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded, or some translations say lonely place by himself, and when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. But his first instinct uh, on reflection and the suffering that he experienced because of John's own death, uh, the first thing that he did is that he sought isolation. It's not unusual for to see that. We see that over and over in the life of Jesus. In fact, Jesus constantly would be uh, going away to pray, right in the middle of the action, uh, going away to a lonely place. Constantly we see that in the life of Jesus. I also think about Paul. You know, Paul uh, was blinded on the road to Damascus and on his way back, what happened? Well, uh, he finally the scales fall from his eyes and then the first thing he does is he goes away to Arabia. Galatians 1 and 2 says that Paul, the apostle Paul went away for three years. We don't know what kind of isolation that looked like, but one thing that we do know is that it was in those intervening years that he got what he called a revelation of Jesus. And then as we know, the Apostle Paul was responsible for nearly two thirds of the entirety of the New Testament. So without isolation, he doesn't have that kind of connection. He doesn't have that ability really to even be able to hear from the Father. And I, I think that's profound. That's profound. I wonder what it would have looked like had he not had those years away. And again, we've been talking about this as a church for a while. We're calling it the wilderness. I think also about John the disciple who is responsible for 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Gospel of John potentially, and then even the Revelation. And we know that he was uh, lonely and secluded and isolated where? Off in the Aegean Sea on the island of Patmos. And if it wouldn't have been for that, he wouldn't have been able to write as he did and have the revelations that he did. It takes solitude. It takes isolation. It takes getting away. It's challenging. This seems to me, folks, 
to be honest with you, something that maybe God, not, well, I won't get into the theological debate on whether or not he caused this or just allowed it. Either way, he's allowed it. But the fact is that God, I believe, is using this as a, a global reset, if you will, and maybe an individual reset for you. I know he's already doing that with me. It's forcing me. Everything's like stripped. I can't, I can call people. I'm on the phone all day, but I have so much downtime now. It's a strange feeling. It's difficult for me to even go out and see people. Now we're in this shelter in place thing in California. And what am I left with? Well, I'm left with prayer. I'm, I'm left with time to worship. I'm, I'm left with a lot of time to, to read and to study and to, to think deeply and just to be quiet. It's, it's profound. I also think about what happens when I get alone. Well, it's always the same. Now, as a follower of Jesus, when I can get quiet before the Lord, and this way, this is self-imposed. It's not even a decision I've made. Everything, the games are off, the, everything's gone. I can't, we can't travel. We can't even go out to dinner. We can't go to the movie. Everything has like been forced on us in some ways. And so Mark chapter 9, verse 2, listen to this. It says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain. And now catch this. And when they were, what, all alone in the NIV, and he was transfigured before them. I will say this. I believe that Jesus is really glorified. Now, what does that mean? He becomes uh, more apparent to us in lonely places. He took them up, they were alone on the mountain, and he was glorified, he was transformed before them. In other words, we could be, we began to get a sense of who Jesus really is when we are isolated. And I wanna make a couple of more cases for that for you this morning. Now think about this. When we think about Jesus and his isolation in terms of a discipline, Jesus, it's just, it was a practice. I'll talk to you next week a little bit about Dallas Willard and uh, his spirit of the disciplines. One of the foundational principles of this uh, life, the spiritual life, is isolation. You know, through the years, I've probably challenged, I don't know how many men through the years to get away, especially in a moment of crisis. Get away, uh, and some even do it annually. Go to get a hotel, check in for one or two days, take the remote control, turn it into the desk, don't do anything, take nothing but worship music, your Bible, and a notepad, and sit there and be quiet. Now, I've had some really funny looks at me through the years, but I have never in the history of my ministerial life ever challenged a man that went away for a period of time and came back and said, well, I got nothing. I, didn't, I, I don't know Jesus any better. I don't know. Every single time they come back with tomes of things written, uh, you cannot believe. And it, they would say always the same thing. At first, it was quiet. I said, man, this is going to be difficult the first hour or two. But then all of a sudden, it felt like the heavens kind of opened up in their isolation and in their solitude. And God began to, if you will, glorify his son. In other words, they began to see Jesus as he truly exists. Uh, the fullness of his truth, not the fullness, but a more comprehensive view of who Jesus is, and it's had a profound effect on people. You know, the question for us, too, is, is God trying to get our attention? I mean, think about historically where God has taken something tragic, uh, both causal on his part or allowance or whatever it is, and he's taken things, and he's gotten the world's attention. Uh, obviously, we can think about Genesis 6 and the flood. That certainly got their attention. You think about uh, Moses himself. I mean, uh, all the wonders that he showed. I mean, they had to, as again, I, I alluded to this a couple weeks ago, Eugene Peterson, I love what he says, that he had to do all these wonders to cleanse the imagination of the Israelites from their old way of thinking, which is going to be something that we're going to return to over and over. We're going to talk about what it means for him to uh, cleanse our imaginations. We need to have our imaginations cleansed. We're so much a part of the world. Uh, being in it but not being of it is so challenging. I mean, we, we're in the world, but how do we not become the, in the spirit of the world? Uh, obviously, Jesus coming to earth 
cleanse the imaginations of those who had ears to hear and believed. And, and now God uses all kinds of things. I, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to live during the time of one of the world wars. Uh, we're losing most of those folks now, those World War II babies, uh, are now kind of exiting stage right. And we don't really have a, a, a war like that, but in some ways, 9-11, as I alluded to last week, um, you know what happened in 2008 with the crisis, and, and they tell me this week that if we have an, another down week, we're on path to have the worst stock market month since 1931. I mean, it's just, it's unprecedented really uh, in most of our lifetimes to see kind of what's going on around us. And so fear wants to creep in and all these things. The question is, might God be able to use this as a reset in our lives, a global reset, if you will, and also as a result, an individual reset in which we kind of take a step back. We call it social distancing. We remove ourselves from the activity. It's imposed on many of us now. Remove ourselves from the activity of just the activity of the world. Everything has been closing down. Restaurants, everything's closing down. We have a moment in time that God may want to be using for several reasons. For those who don't know him, uh, it would quiet their mind enough to maybe hear his voice. Maybe even right here, maybe some of you, you know, I don't know if I believe in this God thing. I don't know, uh, I don't know that I believe in Jesus. I, I don't understand it. it. It seems like I have a lot of questions. But there's a moment where you're actually doing some of this due diligence on your own part. You know, I was thinking, I was having a conversation with one of my friends uh, in Europe this week, and uh, he said, he, he made a term, he said, quaranta, uh, quaranta journey. And I said, what is quaranta journey? And he said, well, that means 40 days. And I thought, oh, 40 days, that sounds like something in the wilderness or something. I said, what is that? And he said, this is actually, uh, back in 1377, there was a Venetian policy uh, from Venice. Ships would come in and uh, they would want to dock. And what they would do because of the plagues, and so there were some of these things were killing uh, huge numbers of people, they would force them to stay out in the harbor for a full 40 days. Quaranta giorni. This is uh, in Italian. Well, it's where etymologically we get our word quarantine. That's where we get it, 40 days. And so as I was thinking about that, I said, wow, that's profound, especially uh, us biblical students who understand this whole 40 days and 40 years and 40, you know, is the Lord taking us to an isolated place, if you will, uh, a, an imposed, uh, not a willingly, many of us, not willingly, but imposing this, this distancing, this social distancing Maybe so we can, you know, we can hear his voice. Imagine yourself as being a ship now, uh, not being able to dock in a normal work, work-a-day world, not being able to dock, and you're forced kind of backwards to sit out in the harbor for who knows how long, but 40 days, maybe, maybe more, I don't know, hopefully not 40 years, but to sit in the harbor and wait, just sit in the harbor and wait. You know, I was... Uh, thinking this week, uh, the first thing that jumped to my mind was a passage in Zechariah 12. And I want you to think about this. I don't want to get into the whole eschatological view of when this will happen. I personally think this is happening already in many Jewish men and women's lives. Zechariah is prophesying a day, and this is, again, you got to understand, this is uh, uh, almost over 500 years before the time of Jesus. It's an incredible prophecy that Jesus would be crucified. And I believe many of these are Jewish men and women who are recognizing for the first time, again, who Jesus really is. Jesus is being glorified in this passage. I won't try to fit it into biblical prophecy or has it already happened or is it happening or is it just a, something that's gonna occur in the future. I'll save that for another time. But I wanna read this passage to you and I want you to see what's happening here in my view is social distancing. Now catch this, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. It says, I'm gonna pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. Now catch that. 
and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him. Now catch this, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, now catch this, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, their wives by themselves, the family of the Shimeites by itself, the wives by themselves, all the family that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. Now, what grabbed me about this 11 times, it talks about what I guess could be construed as significant social distancing, if you will. Here they are, they've gone away to their homes, and there is a moment of profound reflection that results, quite frankly, in a deep repentance and a deep mourning and an understanding, a, a mental understanding that, well, what's happened? They were, in, a, in fact, responsible for the one that they had pierced. Now, you can say what you want, but I'm telling you that what they're seeing, this is a picture of, of a people who have gone into deep repentance and recognized for the first time who Jesus was, that he was pierced and they are mourning over it. And if you couple that then with Isaiah 53, they were pierced for their transgressions. You know, I'm asking the question here, what about this separation? What about this isolation, this social distancing that's been thrust upon us? that leads many of you to tremendous loneliness, to feel like you've been left out in the harbor, so to speak, for God knows how long uh, to see what may happen before you can dock. And maybe you feel that way, but maybe God's doing a very significant reset in our own hearts. Maybe we will be, many, many will be, I am believing that thousands, maybe millions of people in this time of isolation rather than just watching Netflix or trying to find some old movie, uh, people go stir crazy trying to just watch TV all day, that they'll have these moments of increased clarity and uh, an insight and that the Holy Spirit, you know, I've been praying for you as a church and many of you who may just be even watching online, that the Lord would speak to you more clearly than he's ever spoken to you before. My prayer is that we as a church and then an online community would begin to hear his voice in such profound and significant ways that it would be radically different than anything we've ever experienced before. I cannot imagine a scenario, can, can you even imagine just a few weeks ago? I mean, we're, what, we're a few weeks into this thing? Uh, just a few weeks ago, the Stock market was at 29,000. Everybody was partying. Everybody was having an extraordinary time. Money was being spent as if it would never run out. People were uh, having kind of wild spending sprees and people were buying things. And then virtually overnight, what's on us is not only that we, that we don't have the money to spend, even if we had the money to spend, we would have nowhere to spend it. I mean, I think our economy is 70% uh, consumption and there's just no avenue in which to consume. I mean, Amazon can't even get most of the stuff to you uh, at, as, it, as it stands now, some of the basics. But what a weird thing. I, I, I can't imagine that this has come on us so quickly. I mean, the, the, the rapid nature that this, this whole thing has just come on us like this and completely restricting us from virtually anything. It's just extraordinary. And I, I just, I couldn't have even made up this scenario in my mind. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, not, it's so out of, out of right field. You have to ask the question, could God be doing something extraordinary through this process? Now, of course, the question you may be asking is why? Why would God allow this. I mean, obviously, this is not just for our social isolation or uh, for anything. I mean, people are dying. I mean, there are people all around the world that are actually giving up their lives. I don't know what the complete count is, but 
thousands have been infected now, and many of those, even though it's a small percentage, uh, many of those, especially within certain within certain age ranges, will not be able to continue. I mean, they they, they won't make it, and uh, it grieves me to no end. Might God be doing something through this process, and why? Well. First of all, I think we need to lay a little bit of groundwork. Now, the question is, why would he do that? Well, I'll tell you why he would do that, because we are called, as the body of Christ, to be the temple. So I think he's going to both draw those who don't know him and speak to them in significant ways. Remember, the Holy Spirit is there to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Okay, so that's what he's doing in the unbelieving world, I believe. For those who have ears to hear, I think we will look back at this time and see that thousands, maybe millions of people around the world had a first encounter with God. I really believe that with all my heart. But what is he doing with us as already believers? Well, he's forcing us into the harbor. He's forcing us into isolation to do what? To see him as he is and to become the church that we're called to be. Now, we've talked about this at various points, but in the end, we are called to be the temple, the temple. I want to read some of these scriptures to you. We've gone over this before, but in this context, I think it would help give you a real insight. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, if you have your Bible and your coffee this morning, says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, again, uh, the Bible is very clear about not grieving the Holy Spirit. Let, let's be let's be honest. It is so challenging to not. Uh, I think of Paul's letter to Titus as well. It's so challenging to be part of the culture. I think God calls us to be part of the culture. He doesn't call us to retreat, live in some ascetic enclave out in the middle of somewhere, or go by an island and get off to ourselves. He calls us to be in culture, to be participating, and yet He calls us not to be part of the spirit of the age or have the love of the world. So how are you part of culture and yet not loving the spirit of the age? Well, we're called to be both, and it's it's a very narrow, narrow path in which we have to walk. It's incredibly challenging, and and. It takes moments, again, uh, through the practice of the great patriarchs, we see getting away and trying to refocus, reimagine, if you will, the very glory and the nature of Jesus. Let him be transfigured before you when you are in isolation so that as the temple of God where the Spirit dwells, we might actually serve the function of the temple. And that's uh, probably what I'm going to talk to you next week about. Let's Continue here, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. So it says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens. We've talked about that when we went through our discussion of uh, the letter to the Ephesians. But you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself, is the cornerstone. Talked a lot about that as well. So here we have the here we have this metaphor, this picture of a building. We have the foundation laid. It's the apostles and the prophets create this beautiful foundation. Jesus is the centerpiece. He he gives direction to the entirety of the found not only the foundation but the entirety of the dwelling. Jesus is the cornerstone, the very cornerstone that the prophets said that. The Jewish people were going to trip over, but they weren't going to stumble so as to fall, but they were going to trip over this very stumbling stone or the cornerstone. It says, Christ being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing again, and catch this, into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? So again, we have a We are an individually a temple, metaphorically, and then collectively when we come together as the church, the pillar and support of the truth, we are also a temple. Collectively, we create this temple so that God can come and dwell in us. So get this picture, God dwelling in his temple. It's a powerful, powerful picture. 1 Peter 2, similarly, 
We're living stones, he says, coming to him as a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up, I guess this, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. So he, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So as the temple, why do we need to be docked out uh, for a while? Why the, why the isolation? So that we can live into being the temple, live into being these living stones, live into a collective community. We cannot, you've heard me say this a million times, we cannot give out what we do not possess. It's absolutely mandatory that we have something flowing through us. Uh, Jesus' words again, this living water flowing through us and then flowing out of us onto those around us. So again, what do we do in isolation? We begin to see Jesus as he is and he begins to fill us. He begins to speak to us. He begins to, the spirit begins to move in such a substantive way that we return, that we stay in alignment, if you will, as being the church. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 16. Do you not know that the one that joins himself to a prostitute, and he's going to use a metaphor here, huh? the direct context is this linkage between the church and Christ. He said, if you join yourself to a prostitute or a harlot, it, you're one body with that person. He says, for he says the two become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality, every other sin that a man commits outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So he sets up this dynamic, uh, this picture of Christ and his church, and when we merge with Christ through the Holy Spirit, he fills us with the Spirit, and we become one flesh. In other words, there's a, there's a deep, profound connection and he's talking to the church at Corinth here, and there was all kinds of uh, sexual immorality, people, there was an incestuous relationship within a family, uh, people, there was temple prostitution, there was cult prostitution, there was all kinds of crazy things going on and just a, a, a ridiculous amount of immorality. And he says, you become one flesh when you uh, go through this consummation act. And again, why would maybe God do be doing this global reset so that we can pull back, if you will, from becoming one spirit with the world. I mean, that's, and we become, again, one spirit with Christ. And it requires that. Now, this isn't just a one-time thing. And again, I'm saying this is doing a massive reset, but I think we should be practicing this kind of reset on an ongoing basis, even a daily basis, to get away and be with God, but this opportunity is upon us. Uh, Some of you may be out there and you may be saying, you know, I have a very significant decisions to make. I'm at a real why in the road in my life. I I have to make some of these incredible decisions coming up or or I'm I'm depressed or I'm struggling so deeply. Look, many of you, what you need is you need a word from Jesus himself. Uh, He speaks through his word. He speaks through a sermon or a message or a teaching but you need a direct word, not from somebody, not from some, some guy comes in and says, I'm a prophet and here's a word from God for you. Uh, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you on your knees in your office or in your living room over a cup of coffee or to having your Bible or down on your face. Say, Lord, I need you to speak to me. That cannot happen if we are so one spirit with the Lord, uh, excuse me, one spirit with the world we have to be able to re-engage the Spirit of God. It's a little bit of what Jesus' admonition in Revelation 3 was. You know, you need to return to your first love. Uh, Again, my question, folks, is, is this moment in time, this unique, bizarre, completely unforeseen moment in time, an opportunity for us to have this individual reset on a global scale, on a church scale, maybe our church, this is an opportunity to reset, I think there's a chance if that happens, we will come back so much stronger 
uh, at the end of however long this period lasts for, uh, it may be mind-boggling. And I'm, I've got to tell you, there's going to be an incredible amount of prayer, both on my part, on the pastoral team, on our executive team, prayer for our church that this is what would happen over these coming weeks, is that you would be able to hear the voice of Jesus, probably not audibly, I never have, but you would be able to hear his voice and be able to get the word, the sustaining word that you may need in this season or maybe even a season that's yet to come, a season that's just around the corner. Uh, you may need a directive, you need a word of encouragement, whatever that word is, we need it. That's what I'm praying that the Lord would speak in very definitive ways. So what I wanna do now is shift, because I get this. I've been getting this question a lot, People asking me, you know, is this the end time? Is this, uh, are we in the end times? Well, we've been in the end times ever since Jesus ascended. I mean, we're in the last dispensation of time, if you will, in which uh, is a, what many call the church age. Uh, but th when we talk about the cataclysmic, apocalyptic, you know, kind of could this be, I can be honest with you and say, I don't know. I know Jesus said, in the end of time, there's gonna be all kinds of things, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in various places and famines and all this. And, and maybe this leads in some ways to a, a famine of sorts. I, I, I don't know. I know this or maybe birth pangs. Is this kind of the ultimate or maybe even the penultimate act before Jesus comes back? Nobody knows. Even Jesus said he no man knows the day or the hour. But I think what's fair to say is that as we go to the book of Revelation, I want to go back to this idea of harlotry and prostitution and who is this figure in the, in the, in the Revelation that John writes while in isolation on the island of Patmos. He talks about this great harlot. I, I won't go into the fullness of it. It has religious uh, implications in terms of maybe being kind of a one world religion uh, of some sorts, but it's even more than that. Allow me to read this portion of the harlot. And again, what is Paul saying? He says, we can't make ourselves part of the harlot. We become one flesh. We don't want to become one flesh. We want to become one spirit with Christ. Revelation 17, verses one through five, catch this. The one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke to me saying, come here and I'm gonna show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Now this is clearly a picture of the world system. It has religious overtones, but in general, it's a picture of the spirit of the age, the spirit of the world. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, notice, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, a name was written, a mystery. Now, so we can't, we can't be definitive about this. We can speculate on who this figure is or what this represents symbolically. But here's what we know. It's a mystery, and it says this on her forehead, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now, here's the point. Again, I, I don't want to get into... Uh, an eschatological debate about what revelation means and how this fits in and what future event this may picture or symbolize. There's a couple things we can know how, and questions that I think we have to ask. First of all, how entwined are we with the mystery harlot? How entwined are we? How much of the spirit of her has seeped into our own spirits? How much of the things that she loves and stands for, do we love and stand for, number one. Number two, how drunk, in other words, have we lost our ability to discern, have we become with her ideologies and her practices without even recognizing it? You know, one of the things that happen when I go away and spend time in isolation and solitude, I, it's like the Lord floods me with a reality check in where all of a sudden things that, 
you know, I'm trying to grasp on or I'm, I'm so riveted on or things that have become of, of, of strange importance to me that have no eternal value whatsoever and, or, or just ways in which the, the culture seeps in and begins to change and change the way I think about the Bible, changing the, the way I think. It just has that insidious kind of uh, ability to sneak in and begin to change my perception and I always can see it when I start, again, fear is a picture of us caring about the wrong things, misprioritizing that, and fear is a result. Faith is the opposite. And then lastly, are we separate and are we different or do we look and feel like... Now, Babylon was always a picture of the world system. For them, it was the epicenter, right? Babylon the Great. I mean, this was a, a huge world power for them. Rome then would be take the form of Babylon later. Rome became the epicenter. Today you can think in terms of the spirit of New York or the spirit of Los Angeles or you know Hong Kong or where you know London or whatever these major uh, cities are and the spirit of the age abounds there. Are we part of that? I mean, that's the thing that grabs me. Do I just go about my daily life not even questioning the appetites that are developing me in me Maybe this global reset would do something very profound in me and allow me to begin to discern and not be drunk with her ideologies, become sober in my ability to even think about my own attachments. You know, 2 Corinthians 6 says this, what agreement, remember we're the temple, that was the point, what agreement has the temple of God with idols for we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and I will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. And then no, notice what he says, therefore come out from their midst and be separate. Well, I think we would all agree that one of the things that has been forced upon the world is to come out and be separate. Uh, this isolation that we've been talking about. Uh, He's, he's calling his church to come out and be separate in a sense, but now he's forcing it on us in a very physical and literal way uh, so that we might be able to see the spirit of the world. It says, don't touch what is unclean and I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And then lastly, Paul uh, reveals his own heart and, and as we move on to 7 verse 1, he says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. So again, in summation here this morning, what if, what if the very purpose for this whole, and I'm not saying again, we, we're not going to debate God causing this or allowing this, obviously he's allowed it, but what what, what purpose might God find or use this episode, this coronavirus, COVID-19, social distancing, shelter in place, words we, we'd never even conceived of just a month ago, what might he be doing it? What might he be doing? I think two things. Number one, if you're listening to this and you don't know Jesus and you've never made a definitive cut from the world and, a, and made a decision that you're going to believe into him, that you're going to, the Bible simply says, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the wrath that abides on the earth. Uh, let me tell you something, coronavirus is nothing compared to the wrath of God that abides on the earth. And you say, well, I don't believe in a wrathful, vengeful, mean God. Look, you wouldn't want to believe in a God that didn't hate sin and didn't hate the consequences of that sin on his creation. You would not want to serve a God. So if that's the case, and we, we have this big place to, to sit back in the harbor, if you will, quaranta giorni, and the 40-day wait in that harbor to be isolated, might he use this time for you to speak to you if you don't know him? And I would ask you simply, look, if you don't know Jesus, cry out in this time. I mean, you, 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 if you're sequestered to your house, if you're quarantined uh, for, because you maybe have coronavirus or you've been tested positive, cry out to God. I mean, take this moment in your life 
and say, God, speak to me. I'm telling you, it's quiet. I, it's eerily quiet. I mean, normally we have my our back door open. We live kind of close to a busy road and cars are going in and out and in and out. And then all of a sudden we see this, we, we, just, we hear this. Well, well, we don't hear anything. It's this glorious silence. You know, it's in the silence that God speaks. He's a still small voice. And then secondly, I would simply say this. If you've already decided to follow Jesus, take this opportunity to live in solitude, get away even from your own family for periods of time, worship, pray, seek his face, and ask him for a word for you. Ask him to speak to you in very profound ways. That would probably, in my own experience already, is included, Jeff, you're, you're too caught up in this. You need to pull back and re, re-energize your focus. Why are you worried about these things? Uh, there's no reason to worry about that. Let's let's focus over here. Jeff, get out of your own way. Don't be so self-consumed. Think about others. Get on the phone. Call other people. Invest yourself in other people's lives. Whatever it is, whatever that word is, or a, a, maybe a very direct word for you. So my prayer in closing will be simply that God is going to do something profound in this time of social separation. Something profound as you sit as we all sit out in the harbor, not able to re, re-enter the normal streams of life for this period of time, however long it be, and that God would use this in a very profound way, both in your life, in the life of church at the Red Door, and then globally. And so if you wouldn't mind me closing this morning with just this, uh, this prayer, Father, I, I thank you for this moment. I, I thank you. I, I, I am no longer, I, I have quit questioning you. Why have you allowed this to happen? It seems like a, the worst time in the world. We're just about to get our piece of property and, and we get kicked out of our place. We can't gather. We don't know what's going to happen. Lord, we're, this is a terrible time. And I can tell him uh, a thousand different reasons why this is a terrible time. And yet, Lord, as I've cried out to you, I believe you've put this on my heart. This is a moment that you have given us as the church. It's a moment that maybe you're giving the whole globe kind of a a moment where there's a hushed silence, where all the cacophony, all the, the voices from everywhere are just quieted for a period of time that you might actually, through the Holy Spirit, speak to those who don't know you, let them know that you exist and that you love them. Speak to your church, cleanse us, let us separate ourselves from the spirit of the world, not removing ourselves from culture, but just removing ourselves from the spirit of the world. Lord, that we would become the temple, that we would become your temple. Lord, that's my prayer, that we would, and from that temple, maybe as we will look at next week, that these rivers of living water would begin to flow and, well, we, we would serve our function and dead things would become would be, come back to life. So Lord, I also pray over all those listening in this morning or over the coming weeks. Lord, I pray for them. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in a very powerful way, that you would protect us from this plague, if you will, from this, uh, from this virus, that those who are sick, Lord, that, you would, uh, that they would recover. Lord, we pray for our earth. We humble ourselves before you and recognize, Lord, that you are the creator of all. And so, Lord, thank you for this time together. Help us maintain uh, our ability to be connected as a church And I pray uh, all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, it's great being with you. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be right back here in my office next week. And by the way, this week, uh, we're probably going to be coming to you once, maybe twice, with just little three or four minute, you know, encouragements during the week. We know you're suffering. And those of you who are lonely, please reach out. I mean, we have people that if you need somebody to shop for you, if you need anything, if we can do anything to serve you, uh, we want to do that as the church. Love you so much and uh, have a glorious sequestered day.